Now, every one of us, the day we were born, we were instilled within us a sense of right and wrong. Romans 1 says everyone who's ever lived has been born with a conscience. It's what rises up within us when we see somebody being treated unfairly. It's, uh, it's, it's, it rises up within us. When we watch the news, when we hear reports, when a friend or family member tells you about how they were treated, when a young child tells them how they were treated at school, it rises up in us. That's not fair, right? When we're at the grocery store and somebody with 12 items goes to the line that says 10 items or less, everything in us says, that's wrong. There's rules for this, this type of thing. And you're outside the rules. Get into your own line, right? We feel it every day. Hundreds of times a day, there are things in us that we see and we're like, that's not right. That's not fair. That is because we were made in the image of God. That is one of the implications of being made in the image of God. We have a sense of right and wrong. And when we see somebody being treated unpoorly, it is our right and our obligation to do something. We are in the middle of a series that's coming to an end called Jesus and. And every week we've been looking at different cultural topics that we are faced to address, even as a follower of Jesus. Things like gender and politics and abortion. And this week we're looking at justice. Now, at first glance, you may think, well, what? I don't understand the problem with justice. Actually, it's becoming more and more of a hot button topic, especially even in the church. Justice, this term called social justice, that uh, no, all the church should be doing is preaching Jesus. We shouldn't be involved in social justice. And so there's really two camps of thought when it comes to justice. One is that's an individual problem. And so the individual needs to solve the problems in their life, pull themselves up by their bootstraps, and figure it out. Come on, what's your problem? The other camp would say, no, this is a systematic issue. That this is because of poor corporations, and this is because of government programs, and this needs to be solved in more of a systematic approach. And so as a follower of Jesus, which, which way is it? Well, today we want to talk about biblical justice, because the Bible should always inform our politics, not the other way around. So often we get into trouble when we allow politics to inform us and in how we interpret God's word. No, it's the other way around. The Bible is the foundation. The Bible informs us of how we are to think and act about these things. When I was uh, just graduated from Bible school, my wife was still in college, and so I needed a job in the Chicagoland area for a couple years. So I took a job at Lydia Home Association. It's a residential home for boys and girls, about 40 boys and girls, 20 girls, 20 boys. And I was a house parent on a floor of about 10 boys. Now, these children were so behaviorally challenged, they couldn't go into a, quote, foster home. And so this was more of an institutional home for 40 children. And I remember quickly of being exposed to injustice by working in this home because six out of the 10, the first 10 boys I worked with, six of them had physical scars on their body that they were carrying around from the sins of their parents. Scars like cigarette butts that they would burn into. I mean, one boy had his whole arm was covered with cigarette butts or, or children that had been strangled with extension cords and tied up in closets. And, and I remember I had all this biblical training. I was idealistic and zealous and ready to go, change the world. And I was, my first job was in this home in, in Chicago. It was overwhelming. And as that moment, I realized what God calls himself all throughout scripture. God identifies himself as the father to the fatherless. He sees the refugee. He identifies himself with the poor and with the widow. Those are what the Bible calls the vulnerable quartet. The beautiful quartet that over and over and over again all through scripture, God says, I'm their God. I see them. I see every immigrant, I see every widow, I see every orphan, and I see everyone who would consider themselves poor. Every week we've identified three things that you and I are to do all throughout our day. When we run into a need, when we see a challenge as a follower of Jesus, we're to say, I see you. Go to places where you see people who are in need. I see you, I empathize with you. 
empathize. I understand. I'm, I'm going to do what I can to understand. I'm not in your shoes, but I want to be in your shoes. I want to understand what it's like to be in your shoes. And the third is I want to help you. I want to help you. I see you. I empathize with you. And I want to help you. God identifies himself. There is no other God of any other religion that would identify himself with the poor. I mean, that is, that is his name. He says, I, I am the father to the fatherless. Over and over and over, all throughout the Old Testament, that's who he identifies himself with. Learn to do good, Isaiah 1 says. Learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's case. Jeremiah 22, verse 3. Thus says the Lord, do justice and righteousness and deliver from the hand of the oppressor him who has been robbed and do no wrong or violence to the resident alien, the fatherless and the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. Last one, Psalm 82. Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. In the Old Testament, over 200 times, this idea of justice shows up over and over and over again. In the Old Testament, the nation of Israel is what we would call a theocracy. We won't see the theocracy again until God's kingdom comes to earth. But right now, we don't live in a theocracy, so don't try to implement the theocracy, Christian. But we live in a republic, right? And so we have a say in what laws and legislations are passed. We, we get an opportunity. We have the responsibility of, of voting. But what does justice look like in the Old Testament? In God's economy, he always made room for the vulnerable quadrant. Always made room for the poor, for the widow, for the orphan, and for the immigrant. And as such, you and I should always make room for those four. Our church should make room and have margin for those four. Micah 6, 8, what does the Lord require of you? It's a summary of how to live, Christian. What's the Lord require of you? To do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with the Lord. Does that define you? Does that describe you? To love kindness? The word for mercy in the Old Testament is has said. Has said. That is the disposition or the attitude of mercy. When you see someone, you have empathy for them. That's has said. It's, it's God has a said for us, but he doesn't stop with has said. He doesn't just stop with the attitude, right? God hasn't called us just to have sympathy for people, but to act on it. The verb of mercy is misfat. It's, it's justice to treat people equitably, either punishment or rights, to give them their due what is due them. That is the verb. Now, every one of us, the day we were born, we were instilled within us a sense of right and wrong. Romans 1 says everyone who's ever lived has been born with a conscience. It's what rises up within us when we see somebody being treated unfairly. It's, uh, it's, it's, it rises up in us. When we watch the news, when we hear reports, when a friend or family member tells you about how they were treated, when a young child tells them how they were treated at school, it rises up in us. That's not fair, right? When we're at the grocery store and somebody with 12 items goes to the line that says 10 items or less, everything in us says, that's wrong. There's rules for this, this type of thing. And you're outside the rules. Get into your own line, right? We feel it every day. Hundreds of times a day, there are things in us that we see and we're like, that's not right. That's not fair. That is because we were made in the image of God. That is one of the implications of being made in the image of God. We have a sense of right and wrong. And when we see somebody being treated unpoorly, it is our right and our obligation to do something. Unfortunately, many times we feel like I, it's too overwhelming. I don't know what to do. This problem is greater than anything I could do, so I don't do anything. And maybe you've felt that way. Or this is somebody else's problem. I hope and I pray. I'm going to pray for that person that somebody else gives, somebody else serves. And so we pray for misfot, uh, justice. One day everything will be made right. It's not today. 
at least up to this point. It's not today. Christian, one day, everything will be made right. Everything that is wrong will be made right. All oppression shall cease. We'll sing that in a couple months. But the implication is true today. All injustice and all oppression will be made right. The other word, uh, misfot, is to make things right. Give people their rights. Why? Why would I do that? As a follower of Jesus, because I've been made right. Because I was made right, it is always right to help make you right. If you're taking notes. Let me say that again. Because... There was nothing I could do. I was spiritually poor. I was spiritually broken. There was nothing I could do to save myself. It was only by God's grace that he came to me and he saved me. He gave me grace. He gave me misfot. He gave me mercy. He didn't just have sympathy for me. Aren't we glad Jesus just didn't have sympathy? He showed it in action. Because I've been made right, because of the goodness and the grace of God in my life, now it is always right to help make other people around me right. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Give people what they are due. Zechariah 7, 9 through 10. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Administer true justice, show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against each other. If you are in school, you see injustice in the classrooms. If you are at work, you see injustice In the corporate world, it happens. The quartet of the vulnerable. Why? Why does God highlight those four? Here are the reasons why. They had no social power. When was the last time you did something for someone who could not pay you back? And it wasn't you give to them so that one day they'll give to you. They had no social power. They lived at a subsistence level. They lived day to day. They were only days away from starvation because if famine arrived, if invasion came in, if social unrest showed up, if they went to Costco and there's no toilet paper left, are we really doing this again? I think today's modern age, we could add a few other groups of people, homeless, seniors who live on a fixed income and have no family around the refugee, at times it could be the single parent. Anytime we see someone who's in need, it is our job as followers of Jesus to respond, to execute justice. God's always thinking about these four. God is not the God of power. You think of the life that Jesus lived when he came to earth This isn't talked about a whole lot, but Jesus was a refugee. Jesus fled, had to seek asylum in, in Egypt for a period of time. Jesus was poor. Jesus was raised in some case, some element. He was raised by a single parent. Joseph is around for a season, and then he's he's gone. In God's economy, he's always thinking about these four. Let me give you a couple examples. The idea of gleaning in the nation of Israel. If you own land, you owned a vineyard, you harvested a field, God says, go over it one time. Do not squeeze every inch of profit out of that land. You, you, when you pick up those grapes, don't go back a second time because that, God makes room. And a farmer is to leave the harvest on the outskirts of his field for the poor to come for the immigrant and for the orphan. Now they had to go get it. It wasn't hand delivered to them at their door. There was some effort that was required. They had to go do the work to get the, to get the food. But, but God is always leaving room for this idea of gleaning. In Leviticus, when you reap the harvest of land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. Why? For I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 19, verse 9 through 10. If you are a business owner, don't do just what is lawfully required of you. Be more gracious and be more generous. As a Christian business owner, you should be the most generous business owner 
If you own rental property, do not charge the highest amount that you could possibly get. Right? Be fair. Be fair in how you treat people and in, in your business. Manna falls to the ground when the nation of Israel is not where they were and they're not where they want to go. They're in the land between. They're in the transition. And the best way I can describe it is God gives frosted flakes to everybody. It falls from sky and there's frosted flakes fall on the ground every morning except uh, the Sabbath. And so they're to collect, there's to go, there's work involved. They're to go and collect their frosted flakes for that day and for that day only. Not for the next day unless it's the Sabbath. You collected two days. But if you collected three days, there's going to be bugs and maggots that are going to get in and destroy your food. Right? So you had to live day by day trusting that God's going to provide what I need for tomorrow, tomorrow. But for today, he's going to give me what I need today. And everybody got the same amount regardless of economic status. Manna, God feeding the nation. What's, what's the principle here? Don't, don't go after every inch of profit. Consider the poor, the widow, the orphan, and the immigrant. Job 29, verse 12 through 17, Job writes, I rescued the poor who cried out for help. I was the fatherless who had none to assist them. The one who was dying blessed me. I made the widow's heart sing. I put on righteousness as my clothing. Justice was my robe and my turban. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy. I took up the case of the stranger. I broke the fangs of the wicked and snatched the victims of, from their teeth. Job was a righteous man. He didn't sin despite losing everything. Can that be described of you? Here's the implication. I'll sum it up for you all throughout the Old Testament. If I don't have room in my budget on my online account or checkbook, I am robbing God. That is, that is what the principle all throughout the Old Testament is. And so let me just ask you a question. You can do work with the Holy Spirit in this realm. If you look at the last couple months in your checkbook online account, I have to define what a checkbook is for some of you in the room. You look at your expenses the last two months. Is there margin for the widow, the orphan, the fatherless, and the poor? Is there a place that you're meeting those needs? If you do not actively and generously share your resources with the poor, we are robbing God. We are not living justly. Why? Because God does. Justice is inescapable in the Bible. Give all humans their due as creations of God the character of God. We are to love the aliens. Uh, Ezekiel 15, 18, he's talking to the, uh, to the nation. The prophet writes, you yourselves were aliens. He's telling the nation of Israel, hey, remember when you were aliens? Make sure when an alien comes to your door, you open up your door, you feed them, and you give them clothes. You give them shelter. That's what it, that's what it looks like. The just person lives a life of honesty, equity, and generosity in every aspect of his or her life. Speak up for those who can't speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Proverbs 31, 8 and 9. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Now, the Jesus and series. So that was the Old Testament. What does Jesus have to say when it comes to the vulnerable quartet? Jesus shows up and he sets prisoners free. He gives sights to the blind. He watches over the immigrant. No preference to the rich or to the poor. Luke 14, he's telling a story of the owner of the home who's going to throw a party, which is not wrong to throw parties. It's okay to throw parties. It's okay to spend money to have some fun in this world. But the owner opens up his doors and he asks and invites his coworkers and all the people that hang out with him, the people who are like him, and none of them show up. And so Jesus tells the story. Go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. It's easy to give to people who can do something back to us. It's easy to give to people who can repay us. What would it look like for you and I to meet needs of people who in no way on this side could ever repay us? It's what Jesus is asking. Jesus lived his life. He raised the son of the poor widow. He tells the story of the Good Samaritan that we read this morning. 
He, and he makes the hated Samaritan. He's telling to a Jewish crowd. The Jew was the one who was robbed, who was laying sick in the, in the ditch. And you know, he makes the hero of the story is the good Samaritan who they all hated. But he doesn't just minister to the poor. He ministers to the wealthy, the tax collector, who everybody hated. He shows up, and the first people to, one of the first groups of people who get to announce his birth are shepherds, one of the lower groups of people on the social status. He raises the value of women. There's plenty of cases in the New Testament. A woman's testimony in the New Testament was not accepted in court, and yet, time and time and time again, the first missionary is the woman at the well. Time and time again, you see you see Jesus raising the value of the people, the poor, the blind, the crippled, the maimed. Who is my neighbor? It's anyone you and I come in contact with who's in need. Now, the challenge for some of us is to make sure we go to places where people are in need. Some of us are avoiding the road where, this, where the, the robbers are lying in the ditch. We would avoid that road. And my encouragement to you is, no, go, go to the unsafe places. Go to the places where people are in need. If you go all week with never seeing someone in need, let me encourage you to challenge and, and rethink your routine. Because the kingdom of God disrupts the status quo. Point number two. The kingdom of God, we've been talking about the kingdom of God every week of the series. Kingdom of man, kingdom of God. Kingdom of a man says everybody figure it out themselves. Everybody pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Figure it out yourself. Try to, try to get ahead. Try to beat your, uh, your co-workers in your office. Try to get ahead. But the kingdom of God disrupts the status quo. So let me give you some practical examples of, of what that looks like in our day today. Number one, we have to have margin. If, we're, if God places needs in front of us, there's been times in our life there were needs that I was aware of, but I wasn't in a position economically to do anything with it. I was barely able to, to meet the needs of our family, right? And so you got to have margin. What would it look like if you weren't living paycheck to paycheck? What would that look like to build margin in your budget to meet needs? Give, save, live. Just real simple. I'll make it as easy as you can. And young people in the room, if you figure this out early, you will do okay in life. If you figure this out at a really early age, you give first, you save second, you live on the rest. Giving first honors God. The principle of the Bible is I give to God before I feed myself. I give, I give to God. I honor God in every area of my life. When I get a dollar, I give to God first. Then I save. Why? Because the paycheck that you have today, the job that you have today, the house that you have today, you may not have it tomorrow. Every penny that we, we earn this week was given to you by God. And he asked you to steward it and manage it. He is the manager. And he's given us what we think we own is really just on loan. And we're to manage that well. The best way you can manage your funds is to give first, save second. Save prepares for that rainy day. It can also build wealth so that you can do a whole lot more in the future. Give, save, live. And some of us in the room, we've been living paycheck to paycheck for most of our life. You don't have to live the rest of your life that way. Honor God with your finances, and he will honor you. That doesn't mean you give to get. That's not what I'm saying. You will never regret giving to God. I've been in ministry almost 30 years. I've never seen anybody regret giving to God. Give, save, live. A few cautions to give to you on this. Uh, passion projection. Avoid passion projection. So let's say God's called you to a group of people, to uh, a marginalized group of people, and you're giving everything you have to this group of people, and you get really frustrated that nobody else cares about your ministry. Of, right? Be careful with that. Because God calls everybody in this room to something different. We're all uniquely wired. We all have different causes and concerns and passions. And so make sure you don't project your passion onto somebody else. Because that may not be how God's leading them, right? So avoid passion projection. 
it's, it's one thing to inform and bring awareness to the issues that you are so concerned about to your family and your friends. Do that, but don't bring guilt onto them. The second is, is guilt and legalism. And here's, I remember thinking this when I was coming out of college and like, why doesn't every person in every church in America do foster care? Like we could solve this problem, right? And I remember thinking that in the church I was in, like there's 40 kids in this home. Like why, why can't we, you should all be doing this, right? That does, that's not helpful. That's not helpful. Do what God's calling you to do. Don't do it because a pastor guilts you into doing it because that's not sustainable. That might last for a week. And then if it's not a calling that God's placed on you, it will end really, really quick. Another practical thing. When you dive into injustice in our culture and our society, it'll be really easy to make an excuse to say, I can't do it for everyone, so I won't do it for anyone. And instead, here's what I'm going to say. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of homeless in the state of Arizona. And I can't meet all their needs. But can I do for one what I wish I could do for everyone? What would it look like if you did for one what you wish you could do for everyone? My wife grew up in poverty in the state of Florida. She had five stepdads in and out of prison. One of her stepdads was in prison. He had a job taking care of the horses. His superior, who he reported to, he told him the situation that was going on with his wife and the two daughters living in the house, that they had lost utilities. They had no electricity. And my, uh, my wife, when she was in junior high, was doing homework by candlelight. When her stepdad told this story to his supervisor in the prison, he went to his church and they showed up at her home and paid the electric bill. They didn't know. He didn't go to that church. There's no Christianity anywhere in my wife's family, as far back as they can go. But this was an opportunity for the church to meet one need that made a dramatic impact on her life. There are people all around us who are wondering, does anybody know I'm in need? Does anybody know the situation I'm in? And, I, and you and I ask the question, do people know that we care? Is our humanity showing on a day-to-day -day basis? Are we more known for our pride, our arrogance, getting ahead, cutting people off in traffic? I know I'm getting personal now. So all of us in the room, what if we ask the question, do people know that I care? Is my humanity showing? So a, a, a few things. Make margin in your budget. Uh, this is just a personal practice that I have. I'm not saying you all need to have this, but I don't give cash, but I'll meet a need. So if someone's on the corner asking for, for food or for water, I can give them water. You can carry bottles of water in your car, and you can. it's always right to be kind. It's always right to give a bottle of water. So if I have a few extra minutes, take them into a Burger King, have them pick out what they want, and, and give them a meal. It's always right to do that. The Good Samaritan, Jesus doesn't give the context for this man who was in the ditch his whole life before he was in the ditch. And he doesn't give the context of what this man did afterwards. Well, he just took advantage. That is not up to us, my friend. We are to be faithful. We are to be generous. Be wise. Be wise. But when we give in the name of Jesus, we, we, it's out of our hands. And if you ever give, if, you, if God calls you to be generous, to meet a need, do not ask for it back. If God calls you to give, give. Don't ask for it back. Here at Boulder Mountain, we have something called a care fund. 100% of all the pennies that go to the care fund go to meet needs in our church. A family that's in need. They might need food assistance. They might need rental assistance. They might need help with their utilities. Those are the three buckets that our care fund primarily meets. There's a process to go through. But since I've been here, we've not said no to anyone who's asked from within the church. And I'm so grateful for your generosity for keeping that care fund. Now I've depleted it. And so we need, to, we need to fill that care fund back up. And so be thinking about the care fund when you give to Boulder Mountain. Think of that care fund because 100% of it, there's no shipping costs, there's no taxes, administrative fees. 
right? All those things that when you go to pay online, you're like, where where'd these $50 come from? 100% of it goes in the care fund. Just this week, we were able to meet three needs of families within our church. I'm so grateful for that care fund. Love always works. As followers of Jesus, our faith should never be limited to sermons and songs. Our faith should be on display every day of the week, all throughout the city as we go out, meeting needs in the name of Jesus. There's a prayer I'll teach you. God, would you burden me with the, what burdens you? God, give me the eyes so I can see. Help me to see what you see. Give me the, help me be burdened by what burdens you, God, and help me to act upon what you're asking me to do. Let me give you just one example. In the city of Gilbert, there's a company called Awaken Windows and Doors Company. Awake WDC. You can go online.com. They're a window and doors company, but they exist by only hiring former prisoners. One such problem in the USA is the issue of mass incarceration. Our country has 4% of the world's population, but 25% of its prison population. Sadly, 50% of these formerly incarcerated end up back in prison within five years of leaving. This whole company is building an employment base out of this group of vulnerable people. We believe these men and women are capable of so much more, including building the best window and door products in the market. Together with you, this is on their website, we'll create careers, break cycles of poverty, and help give a meaningful second chance to those who need it most. That's one company. It's in Gilbert, Arizona, Awake WDC, Awake Windows and Doors. There's hundreds of examples. Maybe God's calling you to a specific group of people. What, what passion has God given you for? Is it for the widow? Is it for the homeless? Is it for seniors? Is it for veterans? Is it for orphans, foster children? Do what God's asking you to do. Whatever that is, do what God's asking you to do. the end of the day, whatever we do, we do it unto Jesus. Jesus says, hey, when you, when you went to visit the prisoner in prison, you visited me. When you gave that bottle to the man at the corner, you gave it to me. When you brought clothes to, feed a, to clothe a family, you, you did it for me. We do it because Jesus did it for us. Here's the reality. We were all spiritually poor. And any time you see somebody in need, do not have an attitude of superiority, for that was us. For that was us. Spiritually, we're all poor. We're all immigrants. This is not our home, my friend. We're all foreigners. We're all strangers. We're passing through. We're all orphans spiritually. Through Jesus. We have a heavenly father who sees every need. And in the church, we're the bride of Christ. Prior to Jesus, we were all widows. Jesus is the groom of the church. Love always works. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray that you would allow these words to sink deep, take root into our hearts. Would you remove any pride in this room, remove any level of superiority in this room? And may we give as has been given to us. May we be kind. May we be gracious. May we be extraordinarily generous and then we trust you with the results of that. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Our prayer... I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for today's service online. I'm going to invite you to our website where there are a number of different action steps to take following today's service. Maybe joining a small group or finding a place to serve or sending a prayer request into the church to let us know how we can help you and how we can be praying for you. If you found this message today encouraging and supportive, I'm going to ask you to like or share or comment. And let us know and, and share that with your friends. If it's been an encouragement to you, I trust you'll be an encouragement to others as you share this resource. Hey, we've been praying for you. We're going to continue to pray for you throughout this week and trust you'll join us again next weekend. Have a great week.